Good morning. See, I've got six minutes. Okay, so, so this is gonna be our largely guilt-free, God willing, um, talk about money. And um, one of the things that happens, of course, is that pastors who speak about money usually do so at a time when the church is facing some sort of financial need or crisis. Um, and uh, sort of the basic message is you should give more to the church. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid the word should as much as I can today. And the church is doing basically okay. Um, if you send money to the church, that would be good. Um, and please don't stop. But it's not like we have any crisis or anything like that. This is just about money. It's just about the connection between real faith and real wealth and the real world. And we just try to keep that connection as much as we possibly can between real faith and the real world. And this is one of these things that, that goes back scripturally right very right sort of almost to the beginning that like uh, Rachel talked about how in Jesus day they had coins just like or similar to the coins we have today. Um, but the Old Testament talks about a time before there was money. The word in the Old Testament that sometimes get translated as money just means silver and it means a certain weight of silver. But it isn't necessarily a coin. It's just like, well, you got some silver and they weigh it out, and that's how you know, and it's, it's worth something, right? So, so even before there's something that we could think about as money in the Old Testament, a key part of this whole law religion framework that they're trying to build is about limiting the power of the wealthy and limiting the needs of the poor. And so, so nobody should get too rich. Nobody should get too poor. The Old Testament works a lot of trying to find a balance in there somewhere. So this problem that we're facing today, right, of some people having way too much and other people having way too little, isn't a product of capitalism. In fact, maybe capitalism is a symptom of the problem itself. So then we come to Mark 10, and, and Mark 10 is hard. Um, I'm not even sure what to do with Mark 10, but that's not an excuse not to read it and pay attention and see what we can figure out together. So a man comes to Jesus. Now, at this point, we don't know anything about him. If we're just reading the story straight through, right? A man comes to Jesus. We don't know if he's rich or poor or anything, but Jesus would have, right? Because if he, he turns out to be a rich man, and he would have dressed probably like a rich man. He would have looked like a rich man, right? It's the old Monty Python thing from, right, from the Holy Grail, right? How do you know he's a king, right? Well, if you don't know the answer to that, you should just Google it. Um, so anyway, right, so this man who comes to Jesus and he wants something. He says he wants to inherit eternal life, which isn't a particularly straightforward kind of request. It's hard to know exactly what he means. Maybe he doesn't even know himself exactly what he's after, but the words inherit and eternal suggest that he has some sort of future in mind. He wants something out there at some point which suggests that his present life is pretty much taken care of. He's okay. His life is under his own control and it's something in the future that he's not sure about. And, and it, it's really, um, it's helpful to remember that it's easier to live life that way. It just is, right? There is something very tempting about being able to say to yourself, okay, today things are taken care of. Next week, I'm okay month after that, probably still okay, who knows, right? And some of you, you know, who've got, you know, long-term retirement savings, you can sort of stretch that out for a while, who knows, right? And, and that's easier. That's just way easier than trying to worry about, well, you know, where is my next meal gonna come from? Um, but, right, and some have that and some don't, and there, there you go, right? But, but this man, so he, this man, he's got that, right? He's got that. But here's something else he wants. He wants something that Jesus has. He wants like the right answer to secure his long-term, long, long, long-term, his eternal future. And his question sounds a lot like this, like what is the one thing that I can do? William Barber um, is, is a preacher these, today, and he is one of the co-chair of the People's Campaign, which is a campaign of the, of the poor, to try to explain to the politicians and the wealthy that maybe the system is broken and we need to fix it. And so he has gone to politicians all, all, all across this nation and said, here are 
R40 demands in the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, so this is what Rev Reverend Barber does. And the politicians, he, he says that the politicians often respond by saying, well, what is the one thing that I can do? Right? And Barber's response is, the one thing you can do is these 40 things that we're demanding. Right? But there's always that desire, right? No matter whether you're working in, in anti-right, in anti-poverty issues or anti-racism issues, right? People want to know what is the one thing I can do? Um, right? And, but but you know, William Barber knows that there isn't one thing you can do that you can like work one day in anti-poverty work and then 364 days supporting the current system that favors the rich and, and somehow call it good. That's, that's not how this works. So what Jesus does is Jesus changes the goal, right? Jesus isn't gonna talk about inheriting eternal life. Jesus says, the first goal is come follow me. So that's, that, which, is, which is an immediate goal. It's a tomorrow or a today sort of goal, right? But you can only do that, Jesus says, after you do the big wealth transfer. Right. So this is about basic wealth transfer. And there's two places that Jesus says you should transfer your money to. The first thing you should do is transfer your money to the poor. And the other thing you should do is transfer your money to heaven. And the cool thing is that both of these things happen at the same time. That when you transfer your wealth to the poor, you simultaneously transfer this wealth into heaven. So it's, it's the same action. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus, Jesus doesn't say, oh, by the way, you could give it to me in my ministry. Right? Because let's face it, you know, if this was, if, if Jesus was, was a you know, preacher on TV, that's what he would say. Oh, you can give it to my ministry and we will donate, you know, 0.07% of it to the poor and the rest of it, well, you know, it just sort of happens. Right? So Jesus seems to believe that he already eats often enough. We don't know if Jesus ate like every day, twice a day, or three times a day, or just once a day. But whatever it was, Jesus apparently was satisfied. He said, I don't need it. So that's the first goal, come and follow me. And the second goal, Jesus said, is enter the kingdom of God, which shifts the whole thing to here and now. Right? I don't remember exactly the phrase that Rachel used, right? but it was a good one. I liked it, whatever it was. Um, if you want to chat that to us, Rachel, that's great, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a here and now kind of goal. And it's, so it's, Jesus has shifted the whole focus from the future to the present. And then comes verses 29 and 30, right? Jesus says, nobody who has given up, right? Family and brothers and brothers and sisters and fields, you know, will fail to receive a hundred times more now in this age. So in Jesus' day, what he has done he is, is he has listed the, the sort of the very basis of wealth in his day. In his day, wealth came from two things. It came from family and it came from land. People who had a lot of money in Jesus' day in terms of cash weren't considered wealthy. They were considered stupid, right? People who were wealthy had land. That was the basis of identity. That was the basis of wealth. So if you got money, you bought land. The problem with that is that nobody sold land, right? Because that's how you eat, right? You only sold land under the most dire of circumstances because what you were basically doing was throwing away your future, right? And buying land was accumulating a better future but you can only buy land if somebody is selling it. So most people had to be like driven off their land or driven into such extreme poverty. That was the way you could get more land. But Jesus says, you, if you give away your land for the sake of the kingdom, you're gonna get a hundred times more. There was a time in my life when my dad owned four quarters of land, four large pieces of land. And he had four children. And so I was in line to inherit a, a good sized chunk of land. 160 acres of land would have been mine at some point when my father died. And, and he ended up selling that land. But if I would have insisted, he could have kept a quarter for me. And then I could have walked away from it. And then God would have given me 100 of them. 
right? And my dad would have gone, good job, Wes, right? Because like 100 of them is like 25 square miles of land. That's a lot of land. That's a really good deal. But my pastor father and me and my pastor son, none of us actually believe this, right? There is something going on here, but you know, Jesus does not want us to take this literally, right? But what Jesus is talking about is walking away from inherited security, which is a hard thing to do, right? That this, this, right, this young man was not the only person in the world who's going to walk away from inherited security, who is, is going to refuse to do that. Jesus appears to be advocating an inheritance tax of 100%. Right here, let's help everybody, right? There's no more inheritance, right? You're gonna earn it on your own. Wow, look, money is slippery. That's always my first rule of money. Money is slippery, right? Especially, right, kick, well, I mean, cash is slippery, first of all. You know, growing up, you'd have some money in your wallet and then you take up your wallet and somehow it, it, it wasn't there anymore. Like, like, where did that go? Anyone else have that happen? We, we, we noticed it again in Ghana, because Ghana is pretty much clearly a cash society. And so I would walk the half a mile to the nearest ATM. And sometimes it was a dusty road and sometimes it was a wet and muddy road, but it was a half mile walk to the nearest ATM. The ATM worked at least half the time, um, something like that. And I'd bring back this wad of cash and I'd go, wow, don't wanna do this again. I got enough here for a month, I'll be fine. And then the next week, find myself doing it again. Like, where did it go? Right? And like, I saw cash is slippery, but you know, credit cards are worse because credit cards don't ever go away. It's like, it's always there. I always got more, 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 more. And suddenly, you know, while you get to the end of the month, you go, well, I had a pretty good month. Didn't spend hardly anything at all. And then the credit card bill comes and you go like, where, what, what? Right? So money is slippery. And it's really important to start there, I think, because, right? And so that's why the Bible advocates something called first fruits giving. And in first fruits giving, you give the first bit to God. Because the reality is for most of us, if we give our leftovers to God, God doesn't get very much, right? And what we do with our money, what we do with our wealth is, is just one of the most obvious signs of who we think we are, of who we really are. Right? This is a, it's such a visible sign of your priorities, right? And so if you give leftovers to God, that says something about who you are, right? No guilt, just reality here, right? And the reality is that there are hungry people in Morgantown, lots of them, right? Which is why our, you know, and in, in West Virginia, it's crazy, right? Which is why we're giving money to the Mountaineer Food Bank this month, this month in the, in the, kaleidoscope of blessings, right? Why, why do we need a food bank in the richest country in the world? Well, because our system is insane, right? And, and because money is slippery and it just goes away. So, right, I, I say this now because in the last few weeks or maybe, who knows, maybe in the next couple of weeks, depends on how your bail system works, you got $600 from Donald Trump. That's what mine said on it anyway. We got this check from Donald Trump for $600 or $1,200 for the two of us. Some of you needed that money, right? Some of you actually need that money because there's bills to pay that aren't getting paid, right? Maybe you like, like, maybe you like having heat, who knows, right? Or you got student debts, you know, coming out all over the place. So then you should use that money, right, for needs, right? But lots of us also don't need this money that it's just gonna go in the bank and it's gonna be another number and it's all gonna be meaningless, right? And so I'm gonna suggest, right, that you not should, do have a moral obligation to give this money away if you don't need it. Right? I'm gonna suggest that you do have a moral obligation to give some of it away even if you don't need it because there are people out there who need it more than you do, right? And I'm not gonna suggest that you give it to church, although again, if you do that, we'll be fine, right? That will be okay. We'll take your money and put it to good use, right? 
it would even be interesting like just to put it into cash and go give it away to poor people. I don't know how that would work, right? But, but you know, my reading says that the most, right, that the best way to get money to poor people is to give money to poor people, right? But, right, whatever it is you do with it, I'm gonna suggest that if you don't need that money, you have a moral obligation to give it away. And what you do with it is up to you. So that's my sermon on money this morning. Um, and this could make for a very awkward breakout room um, or not. Right? But I would invite you to continue this conversation among yourselves um, in a breakout room now. And, and uh, yeah, there we go.